Gentlemen, I want to welcome you to my humble home and thank you for agreeing to participate in my wonderfully and lovingly crafted homebrew Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition campaign. Trump, Obama, Biden and Bush, welcome to the return of Cesarac. We really appreciate you having us here, Sean. I assume you've managed to fit us into your schedule now that you've finished up with Knights of the Zodiac? Oh yeah, I assume you made a boatload of cash off that. Trump, take that stupid helmet off. You sound weird. Fine, fine. Uh, anyway, yeah, yeah, Sean, I haven't watched it myself. Uh, not my cup of tea, but definitely a smart business decision on your part. You and your friends are most certainly welcome to be here, Obama. Yes, Trump, I did make a decent pound off of the film. Now back to Wait the a minute, who brought me to Sean Connery's house? I thought he was dead. Oh, fuddy-duddy, how did I get here? I was literally just at Cold Stone getting some chocolate chocolate chip waffle cone goodness. Joe, we literally picked you up from Cold Stone 30 minutes ago before we headed over here. I don't freaking understand how you can run a country when you forget something every other three hours. As much as I'd like to get into all of the typical presidential nonsense, we do have a session zero to get started, gentlemen. What's a session zero? Obama! I thought you said you ran Joe through the player's handbook. Technically, yes. I helped him set up his D&D Beyond account and showed him how to open the digital player's handbook. Then I pointed out the most important parts for him to read. In hindsight, I probably should have stayed and made sure he actually read it instead of taking a nap. Yeah, hindsight is kind of a bitch when it comes to Joe, huh, Barack? Hindsight is a bitch for Barack when it comes to a lot of things. Obamacare, Joe as a vice president, the surges in the Middle East. Now hold on a sec. Marrying a man named Michael. Okay, we are done with that. Sean, let's get on with this session zero. Gladly. So as I explained to you gentlemen over text message, you will all be starting at level three. What have you all chosen for your class? Also, since we're starting at level three, Everyone here should have a subclass regardless of the class they chose. So what is your subclass as well? While you're at it, give me your character's name and race if you don't mind. Oh, oh, I remember this part. I'm playing a music man. He's from a school that uses fancy words or something. I'm also playing a goat man named Joel Buckling. So Joe, you're playing a college of eloquence bard? You're also a satyr. The shoe definitely fits. I wouldn't be surprised if you had chosen the weirdest instrument possible. Anyway, Sean, I'm going to be playing a war-forged artificer armorer named Bushmaster 2000. Holy fuck, George, if that name isn't on the damn nose, I don't know what is. You're literally one singular number off of a really fucked up reference. However, we are on to bigger and better things now. I, Donald J. Trump, am going to be playing a variant human vengeance paladin named Pax Ameridona. His backstory revolves around avenging his loss in the grand arena to his arch rival, Rigamus Electionus, because he mysteriously cheated somehow. I knew we weren't going to make it an hour without you shoehorning in an election fraud power fantasy. It can't be helped, I guess. Sean, I'm going to be playing a fallen Asimmer aberrant mind sorcerer. Hopefully I can keep our rabble glued together for this campaign. Well, it at least sounds like the party is pretty solidly built. Support, tank, damage, healing. All the key elements seem to be in place. Did everybody manage to figure out the D&D &D Beyond interface pretty well? That's a big Texas 10-4. Of course. I've finally tuned the details better than anyone else at the table. Um, yes, the interface is pretty user-friendly. Joe. 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 Biden! Joseph! Jiminy Crickets, you guys almost made me poo myself. Well, if you were paying attention instead of trying to catch some Z's, maybe you wouldn't be filling up your Depends. Bush, could you please not use a cell phone soundboard at the table? Okay, yeah, I apologize. That was completely out of order. All right. So we're going to go over some key rules to remember during this homebrew campaign. Critical hits during combat will have you roll your damage dice twice instead of the normal once. We will not be using components for spells since you gentlemen are fairly new to the game. A long rest cannot be taken whenever you want to. An adequate amount of time must have passed or enough events must have happened for one to occur. The money system will only use gold and silver. 
I'm eliminating copper to make it easier to track for all of us. Also, remember, gentlemen, your actions have consequences. I'm not the type of evil dungeon master to kill you outright for wrong moves and such. However, constant act of hobo murdering or complete ignorance can endanger you and the whole party. If there's anything I missed here that becomes important later, we'll go over it at that time in detail. Do you guys have any questions about standard mechanics or my homebrew creations? So, Mr. Connery, how are you alive? I'd like your secret to immortality. I was certain that you had died a few years back. Joe, that's not Sean Connery, that's Sean Bean. You know, the same guy that played Boromir in Lord of the Rings, Ring a Bell? He played Ned Stark in Game of Thrones. He's in the famous One Does Not Simply Walk Into Mordor meme. It's always an enjoyable time watching you do this with him. It's like watching a fat kid chase the ice cream truck and actually expect to catch it. If that's not the pot calling the kettle, I don't know what else it could be. I'm not fat bush. I am peak male performance. Anyways, Sean, I have some lore questions. Could you tell us a little bit about this world? The overall history stuff we should know going into the campaign as our characters? Anything about the country or nation we are starting in? Ah, yes. Now that is a good question. The world you gentlemen are in is called Teridia. It is a world kind of like Earth, but between fantasy and high fantasy. The nation you are starting in is known as the Empire of Elysium. The Empire is currently in what would be considered an early twilight era. It is not yet lost, but it is most certainly fading without assistance. As far as world lore goes, mm-hmm. One thousand years ago on Teridia, four legendary heroes rose to resist a great evil. They fought through a great deal of trials and tribulations to hold back this evil for as long as they could to buy time for their allies in the West. However, they could not hold this evil forever. Shasarak, tyrant of chaos, rose up on the far northeastern continent of Teridia. He crushed the peaceful nation of Luntin and gathered all creatures of hate and despair to his side. He fought a long and brutal battle with the heroes of legend, eventually forcing them to retreat west across the sea, back home. Upon gathering his full strength, he invaded the western continent and pillaged another nation, Algonil. As the nations of the continent squabbled over what to do, he built the Alex Spire, which drew its magical powers from the heat and chaos of the nearby volcano, named the Blazing Pinnacle. After the nations of the Western continent came together as the first Concordiat, they marched to aid the capital of Algonil, Algost. There, the heroes of legend reached their final chapter. The accounts of what happened at the Battle of Algost are muddled at best and completely lost at worst. What is known for sure is that Cesarac was defeated by the heroes of legend. The histories of the heroes following that day are mostly lost, save for a monument or a burial site. Although Teridia lives in peace today, the odd show of evil creature here and there across the world is causing fear to surface in the populace once more. Whispers can be heard in seedy taverns, thieves' dens and banded enclaves. Cesarac returns. However, it seems that these warning signs are not noticed by the old nations of the First Concordiat, or their governments are just too large to notice at this point in time. Perhaps the rumors are just that, though. Rumors. The average citizen can only hope that the peace remains. The only fact that is known for certain about the heroes of legend and the Battle of Algost is that they used the mythical sword of creation to defeat Cesarac. The historians claim that the heroes were assisted by a being of untold power, only known by the name Taramis. However, this comes from a ripped page in the diary of a soldier who claims he was there that day, and the page is very damaged. Holy shit, I thought I was coming to play some beginner Dungeons and Dragons. I feel like you just sucked me through a portal into Middle Earth or something. Boromir, help, please. I need you to take these arrows from my small and frail body. I'm only level three. Bush, we're only nine minutes into the first episode. Sean Bean isn't allowed to die yet. 
He has to make a certain time quota in each movie slash show he's in before he can die off. Yes, yes, very funny. I die in the majority of films and shows I star in. Better buckle up on that one, Sean. They're gonna keep hitting you with that shit bus off and on through the whole campaign. That was so beautiful, Sean Astin. I'm going to write so many poems and ballads as a fancy music man in this game. I honestly don't even understand how you've made that bloody mistake with my name. But Obama said you were the Sean that acted in The Lord of the Rings, right? Yes, Joe, but there's two Seans acting in Lord of the Rings. Look, we'll talk about it later and get this fixed up. Sorry about this, Sean. Yes, definitely later indeed. I'm going to have to make sure to bring a more open and patient mind for session one. That'll conclude our session zero, gentlemen. I bid you a safe car ride back home. I believe that's our cue to clean up and get out, guys. Here, Joe, I'm gonna staple a fucking post-it note to your fucking forehead with Sean Bean's name on it. Obama help. He actually has a freaking stapler. Trump, stop. I got three Big Macs and two shakes in it for you if you give me the stapler. All right, Obama, here's the stapler. You got yourself a deal. Damn it, Obama, that was gonna be some sweet ass world star footage and you ruined it. Man, that was freaking awesome. What an absolute wonderful first episode. Hopefully you people outside the screen over there enjoyed what you saw. Who am I kidding? Of course you did. It's me you're watching. Since you did enjoy what you saw with your eyes and heard with your ears, hit that sub button, smack that like button, and smash that alert button. You're not going to want to miss what Pax of Maradona cooks up in session one. All right, Joe, before we go inside, remember, it's Sean Bean. Not any other Sean name, nothing else, just Sean Bean. I really wouldn't want to make him feel disrespected in his own home again. I've got the stapler and post-it notes on standby, Joe. I'm not afraid to use them right in front of Sean. Oh, yeah. I'm wearing a GoPro this session just in case this actually goes down. Not a chance I miss getting this crazy-ass footage. Trump, please put the stapler away. You're scaring me. I promise you guys I won't mess his name up this time. I want to play this session just as bad as you do. All right, Joe. I'm trusting you. However, pop quiz. What is Sean's last name? Bean. His last name is Bean. See, I told you guys I would remember. All right, let's head inside then. Get ready, guys. Today is freaking session one. Now the fun begins. So gentlemen, welcome back to my humble home. I'm excited to have you back for session one, as I'm sure you're all so excited to be here for it. More than excited, Sean. I'm absolutely ecstatic. I'm so pumped after listening to some of that lore from session zero. Definitely agreeing with Bush on this one. That was some epic lore in session zero. Absolutely, Mr. Uh, Mr. Uh, come on, Joe. Joe, you I can swear do this. God. You promised. Mr. Uh, Bean, Mr. Bean, absolutely Mr. Bean. Totally excited to be here. Ah, uh, damn it. Son of a bitch, he actually did it. Damn it. You two are freaking ridiculous. Well, we're off to a phenomenal start already, I see. I don't know what any of that was about, but let's go ahead and hop into this session one. Pax, Braca, Bushmaster, and Joel, for various reasons. 
You've all arrived in the quaint village of Goldcrest, which resides in the Empire of Elysium. Would you like me to give you law reasons for why you're here, or would you like to throw one out? Uh, sure. After losing to the cheating Rigamous electionists, Pax Maradona has come to Goldcrest to rest and earn some spare gold. He used all his gold betting on himself to beat Rigamous electionists. I would say Joel has arrived here as part of a local tour he's doing to increase his fame as a bard. Braca is here in pursuit of more knowledge of the depths, considering this is an ocean village. His subclass is tied to some rather eldritch things. Bushmaster isn't sure why he is here. He was just brought back online in a local artisan's shop. He can't remember anything. Very good. I'm liking the roleplay participation. And definitely the backstory info you're giving me to work with. Regardless of the means of which each of you have gotten to Goldcrest, all of you have found yourself in the local tavern, the Salted Dog. What would each of you like to do? Oh, oh, oh I want to speak with the barkeep about introducing myself and playing a tune for the tavern. All right, Joel. You approach the front of the bar and see a friendly-looking halfling standing on a stool behind the bar. What do you say? Why, hello there, my small friend. If I may, I'd like to introduce myself to your establishment and uh, possibly play a tune to your patrons. The halfling casts his gaze over to you and then glowers at you. Mm, I'm afraid I'm going to have to refuse your request, my large friend. I simply don't have time for bards in my establishment with such a rude demeanor. Attaboy, Joe. Let that little piece of shit know how small he is in this world of big folk like us. Wait, what? What just happened? Joe, for a Democrat, you're not too bright when it comes to hard left-leaning things like diversity and acceptance. I'm surprised he didn't want to smell the little guy's hair. Okay, that's enough bashing on Joe. Sean, can I hear this going on since I'm also at the tavern? It's the weekend, and the tavern is somewhat full of patrons having a good time. Make me a perception check to see if you can hear Joel Buckling's conversation with the barkeep over the bustle of the crowd. All right. Yeah, that's going to be a 12. Braca, while you're sitting at your table, you can't quite hear what's being said. But you do notice what seems to be a negative commotion going on in between the barkeep and a satyr fellow. Okay. I go up to the bar and I interject. I walk up to the bar and slam my hand down. Halfling, are you refusing to serve this fine patron because of his race? Roll for intimidation of Maradona. Sorry, Braca, because you guys are new. I'm going to let players interrupt a little where I normally wouldn't let them. All right, Dice, don't let a Maradona down. Hell yeah, that's a fucking 18. The halfling barkeep stares up at a Maradona's hulking size. No, 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 sir. The bard is free to drink merry and play songs as much as they want in my establishment. Oh, well, thank you, my small friend. Also, thank you, human fellow. May I ask what your name is? And you as well, my dark friend in robes? Pause. You're playing a fallen Asamar Obama. There is no pause there. Your skin is dark gray. My name is Pax Maradona. Goat man. You would do well to remember it. I am famous throughout the land as an arena champion. Now I expect compensation from your earnings tonight for getting you your silly sing-song spot on the little stage up there. Hello, my name is Braca. I was going to attempt to help you free of charge, before Pax Maradona jumped in and took over. What is your name, Sater? Nice to meet you, Pax Maradona and Braca. My name is uh, Joel Buckling. I guess I could give you a little of tonight's earnings, Maradona, if uh, I even get anything that is. Bush, what are you doing while all this is going on? You've been pretty quiet. I've been observing this entire interaction from my table. My character is driven by intelligence. Having just been currently brought back online, He's collecting data on his surroundings. However, he's identified these three fellows as a possible contact point for getting him back on his feet and part of a adventuring group. Bushmaster will approach the group and introduce himself as a adventurer looking for a party to quest with. Hello, you three. My name is Bushmaster 2000. As you can see, I am Warforged. I'm currently looking for an adventuring group to quest and make money with. Could that perhaps be a possibility with you three? You know what? That actually sounds like a great idea. I could always use more funds for my studies. I love parties. Sure, I'll go with you guys to a party. I, I can sing and play my lute there. If there's gold involved, I'm in. Just to give you guys some pertinent information, as long-standing citizens of Elysium, you're all aware of the fact that almost all towns have notice and quest or bounty boards in town. All right, good, good. 
A Maradona, Joel, and Bushmaster, do you guys want to try and go check out the board in town for a quest or bounty? Sounds good. Let's head that direction. Maybe I'll see some sweet gnome or goblin short stacks on the way there. Oh, no. Well, let's go, Bushmaster. You're committed to the group now. The group exits out into the village streets. You begin to make your way through various groups of people and past the occasional traveling cart, attempting to get to the town center where the quest or notice board should be. As you're making your way through the market, you are approached by an elderly woman. Excuse me, good sirs. You look like fine strapping lads who could handle themselves. I've been looking for my husband for four days and haven't been able to find him. Have you seen him? She shows you a crudely painted picture of an elderly fellow. No, I'm afraid I haven't seen this guy at all. I'm sorry, but I haven't seen him either, ma'am. Perhaps we could look for him for you? For a price, of course. Our services don't come for free, a Braca and Bushmaster. Wow, that looks like a painting of me. Joe, now's not the time. The elderly woman looks up at the four of you and says, Of course, of course. I'd be willing to give my entire life savings just to find my dear sweet husband again. I fear he might be dead. Say no more! Pax of Maradona is on the job. Where's the last place you saw him? We could search for clues. The elderly woman approaches Pax of Maradona and gently says, I last saw him at our home. I can take you lads there and let you look for clues. Sounds good, my fair lady. We can head that way with you now. The group follows the elderly lady through the village for a few minutes until they reach a quaint-looking home. The flowers on the windowsill on the outside haven't been watered in days and it looks like a couple of letters have been ignored. Well, that's totally expected behavior for a woman going crazy about her missing husband. I moved to go ahead and follow her inside. Couldn't give less a shit about flowers and letters. Let's find Joe's confused fart dementia brother and get paid this old lady's life savings. We always have to consider the possibility that the old guy could have legitimately just have died somewhere. Quit speculating out of game and follow me inside and look for clues. The group heads inside together, following the elderly woman. Once inside, you see an oddly empty living room. To the right is one door, and to the left are two separate doors. I asked the lady first for her name, because we didn't get it earlier, and second, for the layout of the house and where in the house she saw her husband last. She slowly makes her way over to you and says, The door to the right is our simple bedroom. On the left is the kitchen and storage room. My name is Amelia. I appreciate you asking. I have felt so alone the past few days. Braca, quit fucking around. Come with me to search the bedroom for clues. Bushmaster and Joel, go search the other two room for clues or something. All right. I go with Ameridona to search the bedroom for clues. I'll search the kitchen. I guess I'll look through the storage room then. All right. Something to keep in mind as you guys separate. As I switch back and forth in between all of you, keep in mind that everything is happening at the same time, not one thing after the other. Anyways, Ameridona and Braca, you guys arrive in the bedroom. Inside you see a simple straw mattress bed, big enough for two people. The sheets aren't on the bed. A medium-sized chest sits at the foot of the bed. On each side of the bed is a simple wooden nightstand with a drawer. Aside from those things, the room has one Swedo dresser, and that's it. I go look in the chest. Good Lord of Maradona, can you not leave their things alone? I'm going to go look for clues around the bed. The both of you notice as you move closer to the bed that you begin to smell a foul stench. Braca, did you shit yourself or something? I'm sure they have an outhouse outside. No, you idiot. The smell is coming from over here by the bed. I go to check out the opposite side of the bed from Braca. What do I see, Sean? On the ground, tucked up against the side of the bed, seems to be two rather large humanoid-sized lumps wrapped up in a large sheet. What do you see, Ameridona? Um, Braca, I think we have a fucking problem. After Ameridona says that to Braca, the both of you hear the door creak and slam shut. Then the room seems to quickly fill with a magical darkness. Pause. Now we go over to Joe. Joe, as you enter the kitchen, it seems like a normal kitchen for the current time frame and law setting. Nothing seems out of the ordinary, except for the fact that it appears that nothing has been touched in quite a while. Um, okay. Uh, how do I do this? I, uh, I want to try and figure stuff out about this room. You're going to want to give me either an investigation or perception roll, Joe. Investigation will have you basically look for clues and evidence. Perception will have you try to notice things that might be out of the ordinary. Okay, I'll do perception then. All right, that's... 
going to be a 12 for my perception. Joe, upon looking closer, you notice that a film of dust has started to form over most of the objects in this kitchen. You know that any living humanoid needs to eat food, and whoever is living here isn't eating food. Oh, uh, that sounds sinister. Who, uh, the old lady? Wait, the dead flowers outside, the ignored letters, the oddly empty living room. In the middle of you passing out the information, you hear a door creaking and a slam on the other side of the house. Pause. Now we go over to Bush. Bush, as you enter the storage room, you notice that it is more half storage room, half office. Inside is a bunch of wooden crates on one side, and on the other is a small wooden desk with some drawers and a few ruffled papers on top of the desk. Okay, well, let's go have a look at that desk and the papers. I move over to the desk and examine the papers on the top of the desk. What do they say? The papers seems to be various letters written back and forth between what seems to be the husband and an unknown person. He complains about a series of onset headaches over the past few days and how his wife Sarah has been trying every home remedy in the book to help him out. Wait a fucking minute. I was in the living room when the old lady told Bracca that her name was Amelia. These papers say her name is Sarah. Something isn't right here. I need to go talk to Bracca and Ameridona. As you discover these revelations, you hear a creaking and a loud slam on the other side of the house. Pause. Now we're back to Bracca and Ameridona. Bracca and Ameridona. As the magical darkness clears, the both of you turn towards the door to witness the elderly lady. However, your head hurts as you witness her visage blur, and you see her turn into an entirely different creature. Obama. Trump, uh, you stop. But Obama, please. The creature snickers at a Maradona, as she can see he is most certainly awestruck by her striking beauty. She softly and seductively begins walking towards a Maradona. You can have all you desire of me, and more if you just submit to me. You're such a handsome and strong man. A Maradona, make me a wisdom saving throw. Hell yeah! 19 on the d20, baby. Nobody questions the Donald's infinite wisdom. Minus the whiz, keep the dumb, and add assery. Shut the fuck up, Obama. You're just jealous of all my sweet ass rolls. Oh yeah, jelly rolls, all right. Fat rolls is more like it. Fuck off, all of you. I am supreme. Crunch wrap supreme. I am ultimate. Ultimate stuffed crust. Um, I have the dominant rolls of the group. What happens now, Sean? The creature fails to charm you, Ameridona. Both of you roll for initiative. We won't be using the battle map since the two of you and the creature are in such close proximity. Fuck, I got a four. That's a 12 for me, not too bad. The creature got an eight. The initiative order will be a Meridona, the creature, then Bracca. I will point out that both of you recognize this creature to be a succubus. A Meridona due to being a paladin, and Bracca due to being a sorcerer. The both of you are heavily aware of how dangerous being seduced by this succubus can be. I rolled to Uno reverse the succubus. Uh, Meridona, it doesn't matter if you seduce her or if she seduces you, if you mate with her, she will suck out your soul and you'll be killed. Damn it, she's so hot though. Well, if I can't have her time to treat her like the thought, she is time for some smite. All right, Meridona, give me an attack and damage roll. That's going to be 19 to hit and 12 damage plus 15 radiant damage from the smite and due to her being a fiend, I'll use my bonus action to trigger a polearm master and strike her with the opposite side of my glaive. That'll be 10 to hit and seven damage. A Meridona rushes the succubus and swings his mighty glaive. His strike rings true and hits the succubus. She smirks for a split second as the glaive hits her and the slashing damage is halved due to being non-magical, but then screeches in pain as the glaive glows with a holy light. A tenth of a second later and smites her with celestial energy. Yeah. Meridona a Meridona twists slightly and swings the opposite end of the glaive at the succubus but she keenly dodges, Bullshit, being aware of how much pain a Meridona can dish out. The succubus, having already failed to charm a Meridona and fearing for its life, looks towards Bracca and sends him a kiss and a wink. My body, every single inch of it could be yours. All you have to do is submit to me. Bracca, give me a wisdom saving throw. Shit, that's going to be an 11 Sean. Please tell me that works out. A Meridona, you look towards Bracca as you witness the succubus say that. His eyes change color and go violet. Yes, my queen, I submit to you. You are my everything. You may take me. I am yours. 
God damn it, Braca, you made me stop thinking about seducing this thought, and now you're over there, simping on your knees, trying to crawl over and kiss her feet. Now we pause and go out into the living room. Bushmaster and Joel, both of you run out into the living room at the same time, having realized that something is wrong after making separate odd discoveries and hearing a door slam. Holy shit, what was that noise? Um, uh, it looks like it came from the bedroom. We have to hurry up and get in there. Something weird is going on. That old woman isn't who she says she is. Oh, uh, yeah, the kitchen, it's covered in dust. I don't think that old lady eats. You gentlemen hear the clang of a weapon and the wail of a screeching woman. Shit, we run to the door and open it. You pull on it, Bushmaster, but it doesn't budge. Hurry up, Bushmaster. Our new friends are in danger in there. Something bad is happening. Hmm. I cast Catapult on the door itself. Interesting. Interesting. I'll allow it. You cast Catapult on the door and rip it off its hinges, sending it careening into the room. It rams into the succubus who was standing in front of the door. Roll the damage on the Catapult spell, Bushmaster. Ah, damn. Only 12 damage. A Meridona, you witness the door blow off its hinges and careen across the room, smacking the succubus across the back. She barely avoids being knocked to the ground by it. Bushmaster and Joe, you have both entered the bottom of the initiative order. The order now reads as follows. A Meridona, Succubus, Braca, Bushmaster, Joel. It'll now be Joel's turn, then we'll reach the top of the round again. Keep in mind that each round is only six seconds worth of real time, and all of your turns are actually happening at the same time. I, uh, let's see here. I guess I'll cast Vicious Mockery on the Succubus. She has to make a DC 13 Wisdom saving throw. I also want to give, uh, a Maradona my Bardic Inspiration, since he's going to be up next. Very wise of you, Joe. Very wise. You realize that I'm the anchor that carries this group. Oh, you're an anchor, all right. Shut the fuck up, you Succubus simp! Joel attempts to mock the succubus with some vicious words, but ends up stuttering and saying nothing. He does, however, play a merry tune and a merry donor begins to feel a well of motivation to take the succubus down. It is now the top of the round, which means it is a merry donor's turn. All reactions have now refreshed. All right, I'm gonna use my bonus action first and channel my vow of enmity. Fuck this silly succubus bitch! If she thinks she's gonna give all her attention to Braca over there, she's wrong. I'm the most handsome boy here. Now I roll to attack her with fucking advantage. Smart move on the vow. I rolled an eight and a 22. Now I have a... 12 for slashing damage and then 12 damage for the smite. So... 18 damage in total with the halved slashing damage. A Maridona approaches the succubus again. He aggressively states to the succubus that she is an enemy of the natural order of the prime material plane, then mightily swings his glaive down upon her. Hell yeah. She screeches in pain champion. as the celestial energy the capitalizes on the original slashing damage. Blackish purple blood drips from under a piece of her armor and she wipes another stream of blood away from under her nose. She slightly sways on her feet before vanishing and then reappearing beside Braca. She moves to him and draws him in close. She then brings him into a deep kiss. Braca, make me a constitution saving throw. Holy fucking shit, the D&D gods shined on me at the right time. Natural fucking 20, baby. Wow, nice, nice. Not only does the succubus fail to drain life from you and fail to recover herself, Braca, but you instantly snap out of her charm, pushing her away and getting some distance. It is now your turn. Fuck this bitch. She literally just tried to drain my soul and fucking kill me to keep herself alive. I cast Witch Bolt at second level. That'll be a <laughs> modded 20 to hit. And 17 freaking damage. Braca jumps back from the succubus. After freeing his mind from her grasp, lightning channels in between his hands, and the room flickers before he snaps it and flashes it towards her in an incredibly violent arc. The succubus is struck by the powerful and continuous bolt of lightning. It courses through her body as she collapses to the ground, spazzing and seizing. Her body begins to sizzle and char. She lets out a guttural screech until lightning 
and then a quick jet of fire and smoke shoot out her mouth. Her body then collapses limp to the ground, smoking and lifeless. Holy shit, I think the body is still cooking, Bracca. He gets the kiss and, and the kill. This is the worst fucking day ever. A Maradona. I'm not sure you wanted that kiss. I think that kiss almost killed him. It almost did. I could feel my life force trying to leave my body before I was able to break my mind free from her will. Well, I guess we figured out what happened to the husband. At least he went out with a bang, figuratively, metaphorically, uh, and factually. But what happened to the wife then? Sarah was her actual name. Founded on a letter in the storage slash office room. Her body is bundled up in some sheets with the husband in the bedroom on the backside of the bed. The succubus has probably been luring people here to feed herself with that fake story. If she was trying to feed herself, she should have went for you, not me a Maradona. I'm a salad, you would have been like a buffet. Shut the fuck up, Bracca. You simped for that succubus so fucking hard. Please, mommy, I'm yours and you are mine. Take me. This is going to be a really interesting first song to write about us. Especially Bracca's part in all this. Joel, you better not sing shit about what happened in here. I didn't say anything about that succubus being mommy. <laughs> I can just imagine it now. Joel up on stage singing about Bracca simping for the succubus. Well, that's a good job on that fight, gentlemen. I believe I'll conclude our session one there, as it seems like a good stopping point. In session two, the party will deal with the aftermath of the battle with the succubus in the village. Make sure you level up to level four before you come back for session two. I do wish you gentlemen a safe car ride home this evening. Sounds good. I'm fucking beat. Let's head to the car, guys. Nobody, and I mean nobody, is to tell Michelle about the succubus event, okay? Never do you like that, Obama. You're my best friend. Too late, Obama. Got it on the GoPro. Get the fuck over here, Bush. I'll kill you. Run, Bush. I'm sitting on him. Get the footage to a safe place. Well, that was a freaking great time. I hope you've enjoyed session two with us here today. We'd really appreciate it if you'd tickle all the buttons on the screen today. Clicking the like, subscribe, and alert buttons help the algorithm get our video out there to more fans of AI president shenanigans. We make these videos for your enjoyment, and the more of you that see them, the happier and more motivated we are to make them. Drop us a comment if you have any suggestions or questions and we'll try to get back to you in a timely manner. Bush, you absolute piece of shit. I found that fucking DVD in my mailbox with the GoPro footage on it. You're lucky I got up early yesterday morning and found it before Michelle checked the mail. Damn, we almost got him Trump. Next time you'll have to sneak in the house and put it in her panty drawer or something. If I catch either of you ever in my house doing anything in Michelle's panty drawer, you'll both find yourself waking up tied up naked and covered in butter in Clinton's basement. Obama. I thought nobody was supposed to know about the Clintons being used as the black hole for unwanted people. Uh, shit. Hello gentlemen, welcome back for the next session. I trust that you've had some time to think about your upcoming actions for this session. Anyhow, brief announcement for you. I've got some friends that have realized I'm doing Dungeons and Dragons again and asked to play, but I had to reject them because of various reasons. However, I did tell them they could come to do NPC guest lines if they wanted. One of them will be here shortly today. Oh, that sounds really cool, Mr. Bean. Who's coming today, one of your Lord of the Rings friends? 
Ah, Joe, I can't let the cat out of the bag that easy. You'll see when I introduce him as the NPC he's playing. I bet it's somebody hot. Yeah. Please tell me it's one of your Game of Thrones friends. Oh, hmm. Sean, I'll follow every plot hook you toss out if it's Amelia Clark. And you wanted to try and dog me out last session for getting seduced by that succubus. Here you are, simping for Amelia Clark. I mean, at least Amelia Clark is real. The succubus was just a figment of the imagination. Nobody asked for your input, Bush. All right, gentlemen. Let's not get sidetracked. Mmm, Amelia Clark. Trump, fucking focus, please. Uh, bloody hell. Fine, fine. I'm sorry. Uh, my bad. So last we left off, you guys had just finished off the succubus in the house. You're all now standing around her freshly cooked corpse in the bedroom of the house. Well, uh, we should probably report this to the guards or something. Maybe, maybe not. They might think we killed the old couple or something. Uh, Maradona, there's absolutely no way the guards will think we killed this old couple. If anything, they'll recognize that we finally stopped this menace and possibly reward us. Oh, a reward! I could buy some new paper to write my new song, The Simp and the Succubus. Fuck you, Joel Buckling. If you write that song, I'll personally send you to the deeps. I changed my mind. This is now a win-win situation. I, Pax and Maradona, will personally escort us all to the guardhouse to inform them of what happened and get us a nice reward. As you guys are coming to a conclusion on what you're going to do, you hear a clattering at the front door and footsteps coming in. You hear someone yell, Goldcrest Guard, show yourselves! Shit! Never mind, bad plan! I rolled to push Obama into the main room! You racist-ass motherfucker! Lies, it has nothing to do with your race, Obama. You just have such a rich vocabulary and you're such an eloquent speaker. Obama, do you allow this to happen or are we doing opposing roles? Whether he's lying about the first part or not, he's not lying about the second part. I'm charismatic as shit. I'll allow him to push me out. My character probably wouldn't expect it or have the strength to resist after the fight anyway. Obama, give me a dexterity saving throw to see if you trip and fall or catch yourself and remain standing when a Meridona pushes Braca out into the main room. Uh, that'll be a 16, Sean. Well done. Right after the group hears the guards call out into the house, a Meridona inches himself behind Braca and positions himself as such to push Braca out the door. Out in the main room, the guards suddenly witness a fallen Asimar in red and black sorcerer robes stumble out into the main room and catch himself without falling. The guard calls out, Halt you! State your name! Your business here! And what has happened? Villagers reported sounds of violence and flashing through the windows. Hello, sir. My name is Braca. Me and my companions were lured here by a succubus posing as an elderly lady who lost her husband and was seeking help. She revealed herself to us in the house and tried to kill us for sustenance. The noises of violence was the battle, and the flashing was my witch bolt that killed her. Her body is in the bedroom with my companions. The body of the couple that used to live here is also in the bedroom. And based off your explanation and offer of proof right around the corner, you have put the guard's mind at ease just enough for him to trust you. He approaches you and says, that's quite the story, adventurer. Let's have a look at this succubus body. All right, I wave him to follow me and lead him into the bedroom. I point him towards the charred body of the succubus and say, there she is, all cooked up. He stares at the body and says, by the one God, you weren't lying. Maybe this is what's been responsible for the occasional disappearance of a villager here and there for the past week. We'll take care of everything here. The captain will want to hear about this from you guys. One of the guards will take you there. You aren't in trouble. Thank you for taking care of this. He waves in another guard and tells him to take you to Captain Ironstone. The other guard hollers for your attention and asks for you to follow him. Well, it looks like everything turned out in our favor. Cease, nothing to be afraid of, a Maradona. I wasn't scared. I have no problems dealing with the law. We're the good guys. Says the guy who grabbed the first minority he could find and yeeted him out the room. I'll teach you the true meaning of yeet if you don't leave it be Bushmaster. Yeah, I'm sure you will. You'll head over to the local ye old tavern and order a whole hog, then proceed to yeet it down your gullet. Oh, I never got to play at the tavern. I forgot about that. Shut the fuck up, Braca. I'm going to personally fund Joel's The Simp and the Succubus song and protect him from your reprisals. 
Ah, I appreciate that, Amaradona. No problem, little goat man. We'll see if that's where your hard-earned gold actually goes, Amaradona. Will you guys shut the hell up? The guard is waiting on us. Okay, yeah, let's follow the guard. The guard quickly escorts you through the village and to the guardhouse. It's not much more than a barracks with a medium-sized office and jail attached to it. The guard who escorted you asked you to wait a second while he goes and fetches Captain Ironstone. I wonder if we'll get any sort of reward for taking down the succubus. That one guard made it sound like she may have been responsible for more than a few murders. I'd imagine we would if the captain has any sense of honor. We took care of something that wasn't even on their scryer. We better get a reward. Braca almost died and I had to wail on that thing and not even in the real fun way. I mean, it was a fun way, but not the fun I really uh, wanted to have with her. Uh, and you want to call me the simp? As you gentlemen are talking, you hear some footsteps cross the corner and a deep accented voice begins speaking. So, these are the mighty heroes I've been told about that killed the succubus that had apparently murdered the old Smithers couple. Holy shit. Holy shit. Holy shit! Uh, what's going on? It's, it's fucking, fucking Liam Neeson. Neeson. All right, come on, guys. I'm here for some fun, not to get fangirled to death. Keep it in your pants, gentlemen. This is our guest for the session. He'll be voicing Captain Ironstone, as you've probably already deduced. My apologies, Mr. Neeson. Big fan. Nice to meet you. Uh, anyways, back in game, I looked at Captain Ironstone. Yes, I single-handedly fought the succubus while my companion, Braca had to fight through her seduction. He almost had his soul sucked out by her through a kiss. Hey, I smashed a door over her back. Don't leave me out. Uh, yeah, I was there too. I uh, inspired a Maradona to fight on. Yes, and as soon as I snapped out of her charm, I roasted that bitch with lightning until she was dead. I softened her up for you for quite a bit. Uh, most of the work, really. I mean, hell, Bushmaster got her with the door. By the time you got to her, she was bleeding out her nose and from under her armor. You probably could have thrown your floppy hat at her and killed her. Well, regardless of how you made it happen, the village thanks you. We had no idea such a dangerous creature was here. There's no telling how many more people it could have murdered if it hadn't had been for you adventurers. We'll have to investigate further to see how many disappearances it was responsible for. Well, sounds like we've done a, a great service for the village and country. Mm-hmm, reward? Mm. Ah, yes, I do suppose a reward is due. If we had known the creature existed, a bounty would have been posted. For such a dangerous a creature as a succubus, 120 gold would have been posted. I'll have a clerk fetch it from the back. You see Captain Ironstone wave over a small and frail-looking clerk. He hurriedly walks off into the back and quickly returns, struggling to carry a hefty brown sack. He flops it down onto the desk in front of Captain Ironstone. Oh yeah, that's what Daddy Ameridona is talking about. Closest tavern, here I come. Prepare the goblin short stacks. I continue to be appalled at that line of thought. That's just the tip of the iceberg. You know, because he is an iceberg. <laughs> Fuck you, Joel. I'm not funding your song anymore. I walk up to grab the bag. We appreciate the reward, Captain Ironstone. Is there anything else we could do for you? The only thing the guard is tracking is a bounty placed by the blacksmith. Something about goblins in the mine. Weird. There hasn't been goblins in the region for hundreds of years. Having a succubus turn up was already seriously unnerving, and will have the village fearful for a decade. The goblins will only exaggerate this problem. I would appreciate it if you also handled this. Mm, mm, yes. Mm, mm. Reward? Yes. Uh, what was your name? Paladin, I assume. Pax Ameridona is my name. Ah, gotcha. Well, Paladin Ameridona. Yes, there is a reward for the blacksmith's bounty, but it comes from him, not from the guard. So you'll need to discuss it with him. I'd also advise going and registering with the Adventurer's Guild before taking his quest. Posting completions of the quests with the Adventurer's Guild can be quite lucrative, I hear. Now that sounds like a good deal. I'd like to head straight to this guild after we're done here. I agree. I pick up the bag and thank Captain Ironstone a final time. I beckon the rest of the party to follow me outside. Farewell, Adventurers. I do hope we meet again, and in better tidings than goblins and fell demons. The party emerges back out onto the dirt streets of the village of Goldcrest. Uh, we didn't get directions to the Adventurer's Guild. I'm sure if we just head into the center of the village, we'll find it. The party makes its way into the center of the village of Goldcrest. It just so happens that Braca was correct. 
The Adventurer's Guild is the second largest building in town. However, that isn't saying much. It was easily picked out by the taxidermy monsters on the front porch. Hey guys, I think that's it over there. That building with the funny looking animals on the porch. Nice eyes, Joel. Let's head over there and see what this place has to offer. The party enters the Adventurer's Guild. The taxidermy heads of different monsters can be seen on the walls in this small and interesting office. All of a sudden, the manager of the establishment appears before you, a towering half-elf with bulging muscles. He has an extremely strong jawline and some scars on his face. He says to you, Welcome new adventurers! We don't see many new applicants in Goldcrest, on account of it being so far out of the way and all that. Holy shit, that's a big boy. Big boy indeed. I step up to him and offer my hand for a handshake while introducing myself. He takes your hand with enthusiasm. Braka will need to roll a strength saving throw. Oh fuck. I rolled a five. He grips your hand with the strength of a seasoned warrior and adventurer, maybe a little too seasoned. You feel your hand strain a little under the pressure and you take one bludgeoning damage. I wince a little and try as hard as I can not to show the pain on my face. Give me a performance roll to hide the pain on your face. Get wrecked, Obama! You've got to be fucking kidding me. <laughs> well, uh, in your attempt to hide the pain on your face, you try and bite your tongue. However, you bite it a little too hard and cause it to cut and bleed. A little blood runs out of your mouth and a tear runs out of both your eyes. The big half-elf stares down at you with a peculiar look of curiosity. He looks over at Joel. Is your friend all right? He's uh, bleeding from the mouth and crying. Sorry, he's probably still suffering some sort of mind issues from being charmed by that succubus. I am Paladin Ameridona. It's a pleasure to meet you. We were recommended here by Captain Ironstone after defeating a succubus that had murdered the Smithers uh, couple and possibly more people. We wish to register an adventurer's party. He looks over to you and says, Nah, wonderful. I'll get the necessary paperwork drawn up. It's been quite some time since I've registered a whole new party. Reminds me of many years ago when I joined my first party. Ah, those were the glory days. I'm long past that time now. I'm quite enjoying my nice and peaceful retirement here in Goldcrest. Oh, so you used to be an adventurer. Were you famous? Did you ever have any bards write songs about you that I would have heard or know? He looks over at Joel while stacking up some papers on the desk. Well, my name is Adavar. Back then, I was called Adavar Orc Ripper. The name is a long story for another day, though. If you hear that name in a song, then it's most likely about me. I don't know any other Adavar the Orc Rippers out there. He looks back over at a Meridona. Anyways, a succubus, you say? My goodness. How in the world did one of those show up? That's a creature that hasn't been seen in hundreds of years. Things have been getting rather odd lately. Lots of creatures turning up that haven't been seen in ages. People are starting to talk about old legends of forgotten dark lords and stuff. I try to keep my nose out of hearsay though. I wipe the tears from my face and the blood from my mouth and speak up. Old legends of dark lords, you say? Interesting. Do you know anything more about this? He turns his head to Braca. No. Like I said, uh... I try to keep my nose out of things like that. Adventuring was a simpler thing in my time. The Concordia Museum in Citadel, the city along the road to the northeast, would have the information you seek. Well, all the paperwork is in order. Could I get all your proper names, then a party leader, and a party name to write down and register you under? Yes, yes. I am Pax Ameridona the Paladin. The one in the robes is Braca the Sorcerer. The one with the loot is Joel Buckling the Bard. And the metal one over there is Bushmaster 2000 the Artificer. I, Pax Ameridona, am the party leader. Now wait a freaking minute here. He looks at Ameridona. Awesome, everything sounds good. If you could all approach the book and sign below your names, please. I walk up and sign my autograph as fancy as I can. Ah, whatever. I go up and stamp my war-forged mark. I quickly go up and sign my name nice and large. Oh yeah, because you are nice and large. Makes sense. 
shut the hell up, Joel, or I'm gonna put a large hole upside you forgetful ass head. So, we're all just gonna sit here and let a Maradona swoop in and be the party leader? No discussion, no debate, just a Maradona is the party leader? What can I say, Brock? My campaign was short but successful. The slogan was phenomenal. I borrowed it straight from the armored boot store in my old hometown. Just do it. Except I changed it to just Ameridonut. Yeah, well it should have been just Ameridonut. Ha 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 ha. Ameridonut, nice. Damn it, now you've made me think of bar snacks. Which made me think of the tavern. Which made me remember that I once again forgot that I need to play in the tavern. Damn it. You'll get to play eventually, Joel. We'll get you there, little buddy. I promise. Hurry up, Braca, and sign the damn paper. We have things to do. Fine. But when things go wrong, I'm going to remind the two of you whose fault it is that Ameridona is the one who's making the decisions. I go up to the paper and sign my name. Begrudgingly. Avadar looks down at all of you. Good, good. Now what is to be the party name? Well, uh, interesting. Anybody got any ideas? Um, well, how about Magic Missile? It's like the D&D version of Drone Strike. Fuck you, Bush. Anybody have any actual ideas? Fresh out here, I'm drawing a blank. Mm, let's see here. Something badass. Uh, I got it, but Eagle's Talon. I, I don't want to give it to you. I'm not usually petty, but damn it. Oh, uh, come on, Braca. Give it to him. It's a good one. Yeah, Braca. Give it to him. Ha ha ha. Shut the fuck up with your outhouse humor, Bushmaster. Okay, Ameridona. Fair is fair. It's not a bad name at all. All right, Avadar. Eagle's Talon is the name of the party. He looks to Braca. Awesome. I'm loving the name. Cool. Now that you're registered, a quick explanation of the benefits. You guys will currently be registered at Iron Tier, which is the starting tier. Progressing to higher tiers with greater benefits is reliant on completion of quests at greater difficulties. It's no secret that all within the Adventurer's Guild aspire to be great heroes. The guild was founded by Paladin Orkut, one of the original heroes of legend. So the greater your deeds, the faster you progress. As he briefs you on the guild process, all four of you, your vision begins to go blurry and you black out. Each of you individually experience a rapid flash of different visions. You see a great destruction wrought upon the world of Teridia. You see great battles fought upon smoke-filled plains. Black banners on one side and multiple different colors on the other. You see the capital of Elysium, Farunist, lies in ruins and on fire. A darkness envelops the world and it seems that there is nothing left but sadness and despair. The final redoubts of hope finally fall. The last vision is that of a column of magical fire shooting up out of a black spire into the sky. It strikes a point in the sky, and the planet is lost in a magical detonation. All of these visions quickly pull themselves in reverse. You hear a voice echo through the darkness. Seek me out, heroes. You are chosen. Do not listen to his messages or believe his visions. This world is not yet lost. As he finishes speaking, you see a bright flash. You see a fractured sword floating above a pedestal, its pieces lining up to almost connect. You quickly come back to reality and your vision returns. It appears Adavar just finished his brief on the guild. So yeah, that'll pretty much conclude the brief on all the benefits being a member of the guild has to offer. Here's a pamphlet, in case you need a reminder. You new members have any questions? <laughs> Adavar looks at the whole party, visibly disturbed. Well, I, uh... I've never had that type of reaction to my brief on guild benefits before. Did I do something wrong? No, uh, no. <coughs> Everything is fine. We had a slight magical malfunction, at, but uh, <coughs> everything's perfectly all right now. We're fine. We're all fine here now. Uh, thank you. How are you? I'll, uh, I'll be right back. <coughs> a 
Are you sure? Uh, is he going to be okay? He's uh, coughing some up in the back office. Mm. Oh, oh, and that one is just making weird noises on the ground. I'll uh, <coughs> I'll try and help him out. I'll uh, go into my files and try and refine my benefits brief some. Obviously, something is wrong with it. Adventurers who defeated a succubus shouldn't have the anxiety to be overwhelmed by a simple, boring brief. I'll head into the back office and send your paladin friend back out. You guys should go check up on that blacksmith quest. Depending on the tale of its completion, you could get bumped to steel tier since you've already defeated a succubus. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll go get that done. <laughs> Adavar walks into the back office and quickly returns with Ameridona. One arm slung over his shoulder, helping him back out into the lobby. Here's the paladin. He's slightly delirious. I suggest you guys make a quick stop outside for some fresh air to collect yourself. Me and Bushmaster collect Joel and Ameridona. We then head outside to try and get some fresh air and recover. The party exits back out onto the dirt streets of Goldcrest. Bracker has recovered from his coughing fit and Bushmaster's intake modulator has debugged properly. However, Ameridona is still delirious and Joel is still unconscious. Bracca, do you have any magic to help deal with this? Whatever the hell that was, clearly messed with these two's minds a little harder than us. I don't have anything that I think would help them. The only thing I have for this that might work is calm emotions. Although that might only work on a Maradona, since he's conscious. Give it a rip. Maybe a Maradona will have something for Joel. <laughs> He's got holy magic. Uh, mm, my head. Uh, that feels better. Jesus. What the fuck was that? Did you guys see that? Holy shit. I couldn't control what I was feeling. I felt so overwhelmed. I just started puking and then I blacked out in that guy's office. We don't know. But I'm pretty sure we all saw the same thing based on our reactions. Do you have anything to get Joel up? Oh yeah. Let me pop his ass with lay on hands. That'll probably bring him up from the shock of it alone. Mm -hmm. ah! There we go. You owe me one. You were about to take the eternal nap, old man. The great Ameridona brought you back from the precipice with the great weight of his holy power. More like the great weight of his fat hands as he leaned on him too hard and almost crushed him to death. I wonder if Rigamus Electionist possibly just beat you in the arenas just by running in circles until your fat ass was tired. Don't worry, Bracca and Bushmaster. I'll remember this for later anyway. Joel is up. Guys, I had the most fucked up dream. It wasn't a dream, Joe. Uh, I'm pretty sure it was a vision. We all got it. Everybody saw a battlefield. Ferranist in ruins. The planet exploding. A voice talked to you. And then a fractured sword, right? Yep. Yep. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, we all saw the same thing then. I don't think we'll find any answers in this small village for this vision. The voice said to seek him out. Whoever he is. Maybe there's somebody in the city out of our mention that can help. Uh, uh, Citadel, I think he called it. We can head there after we finish up that blacksmith's quest. Sounds like a fair enough plan to me. Also, Bracca, how about you split up that coin purse that you snatched off Captain Ironstone's desk? Oh, yeah. Upgrade money. Oh, new instrument. Here I come. Oh, yeah. Uh, almost forgot. We got 120 total, so each of us will be getting 30. Almost forgot my ass. I caught you slipping, Bracca. You were trying to pocket that coinage. Some of us aren't money-hungry sluts of Maradona. Hey, I'm not money-hungry. Um... <laughs> what? Nothing. Don't worry about it, Maradona. Let's head to the blacksmiths. The party winds its way through the people in town square until they reach the blacksmith. Whoever the blacksmith is, they have a nice and quaint shop that the party goes ahead and enters. Upon entering the blacksmith, the party can hear the clangs of a blacksmith at work. However, it sounds like he's in the back. After just a few swings though, the clangs stop. All of a sudden, a dwarven blacksmith pops up right in front of you. Well, how are you we lads doing today? What can I be doing for you? We're here to deal with your goblin mind problem. We just got done speaking with Captain Ironstone, actually. Well, that's the best thing I heard all day. 
Okay, I think we're going to have a problem here. Shut the fuck up and be respectful, Bushmaster. Captain Ironstone had mentioned that we needed to come to you for all the quest info and the reward info. So let's figure all that out. Ah, ah, then sounds like a good idea. So the goblins infested the mine about a week ago. They kill it a few miners and the rest flip. We haven't been able to get any metals out sin. From wit, I've been tailed. There's between five to ten goblins and a leader. The local minning guild is offering one hunter and fifty gold for the problem tire be dealt with. So, uh, I heard goblins mine a leader and one hundred and something gold. Fuck it. We accept. My brain can't handle more of that. Handle more of what? He's got a really thick accent, Joe. I got no clue what you're talking about. He said that the mine was infested about a week ago. A couple of miners got killed and the rest fled. There's somewhere between five to ten goblins and a leader, and that the local mining guild is offering 160 gold for a reward for clearing the place out. I mean, he was pretty clear and concise. What in the absolute fuck? I can't, I, I fucking can't right now. I, my head hurts even worse. And I, can we please go to the tavern and rest? It's been a really shit day. Let's just take care of the goblin mine tomorrow. In a moment of rare solidarity, I agree with Maradona. Let's go shack up in the tavern for tonight and rest and recuperate. We'll storm the goblin mine tomorrow refreshed and renewed. Fucking agreed. Oh, yay! I can go play at the tavern now. So the party bids farewell to the blacksmith and meanders through town to the local tavern. Would you guys like to interact, or simply get your rooms for the night and hit the hay? Getting a room, no interactions. Same thing. Yeah, no interactions here. My brain has had enough for today. I'd like to play. Get Fuck a room, off and get, get a, room. a room. You guys are so mean. I go to get a room, Sean. With everyone getting a room, everybody please deduct four silver from your inventory. However, gentlemen, with that interaction, we have found our session's end point. Prepare your minds for next session, gentlemen. The mine might get rough, who knows? I wish you guys a safe car ride home. More than happy to reach an end point now. Let's head to the car. I need some aspirin or something after all that. Hey, uh, you guys mind if we swing through the Taco Bell drive through on the way home? Crunch wrap supreme. Joe, please. I'm vulnerable. I just need to stress eat. It's okay, Trump. We all have our vulnerable moments. Uh, you deserve them, too, even if you are a dickhead a lot of the time. Thanks, Obama. Uh, you really mean that? Ha! No! Fucking pussy! You just got no, no. Uh, okay. Can you turn the screen more to the left? Thank you. Start of line. Hello, everyone. Thank you for watching. We would appreciate it if you would click the like, subscribe, and alert buttons. Also, leave a comment if you have any ideas, questions, or feedback. We will get back to you as soon as possible. We've recently started a Discord channel as well. The link is in the description of this video and also on the channel page. Thanks for watching. End of line. All right, guys, I'm going to need everyone to forget that Taco Bell trip after last session. It wasn't real and it didn't happen. I won't mention it, Donald. I honestly kind of feel bad for what I said. I wasn't acting myself. Nah, that was comedy gold, Trump. Everybody is fair game here. You can't dome everybody in the group and then think you're special. Bush, forget it happened and I'll cash up you 10 grand. Forget what happened? Now that's what I call a team player. Um, I, um, I'm not going to forget it, Trump. Wow, Joe, look, a youthful looking person with freshly washed hair and they're holding an ice cream cone with, well, look at that. I think the flavor is chocolate. Oh, oh, where, where? Oh, I'm sorry, you missed it, Joe. What were we talking about again? Oh, dadgummit, I forgot. Yeah, oh yeah, that's what I thought.
right, gentlemen, welcome back to the table. Hopefully you guys talked at some point when you were together about how you wanted to accomplish this session's goals. Regardless, I do believe that this is going to be a fun one. Oh, I think I'll be able to lead us through the mine pretty well, Sean. It's just some goblins after all. What's the worst that could happen? Getting stabbed. Crushed by mine collapse. Toxic gases. Poisonous snakes. Deep holes concealed by standing water. Tunnel flooding. Getting lost and starving to death. Hypothermia. Infectious diseases. You're a lard ass crushing me as we walk up an incline and you slip and fall. All right, all right, I get it. Jesus, fuck you guys. The majority of what you said isn't even relative. Stabbing and cave-ins seem like the most likely problem. Um, I think your lard ass is pretty relative, like probably the most dangerous thing on the list. My ass shouldn't be on a list, Joe. You should be. I'm just gonna say you guys are in the hallway outside your rooms after your well-deserved rest at the tavern. This is what you're actively discussing as you congregate and decide how to begin the day. All right. Well, let's get our shit together and head out to this mine. No, no. We have time. You guys have screwed me over for too long now. I demand to play at least one song in the tavern this morning. It's not going to cost us anything to let me do it. Joel, the morning after a night of heavy drinking isn't exactly the time that people want to hear a fledgling new bard play their untested tunes. Now, wait a minute, Braca. I'm sure that Joel could <laughs> bring some wonderful entertainment to this morning. Oh, oh, uh, you know what? It sounds like a plan, Joel. Uh, let's head down to the tavern and let you jingle a tune for this morning's fine patrons who are nursing off last night's hangover. I I'm sure your wonderful melodies will spirit their illnesses away. Joe, don't. Sean, I quickly cast command on Braca. All right, Trump. Obama make a wisdom save and throw. Oh, you've got to be kidding me. Uh, fine. That's a 14, Sean. That'll succeed, Obama. Braca successfully beats a Maradona's. I silvery barbs Braca's saving throw. He has to roll it again. Joe, what the fuck? You're not going to stop me from playing in the tavern, you snake in the grass. Oh man, what a turn of events. Well, Obama, go ahead and... Also, Sean, since it's a bonus action, I'd also like to unsettling words Braca. I will play in the tavern. Joe, for your information, that's not how that works. You were using your reaction just now and it wasn't your turn. However, we're not in combat. So, since I'm curious, uh, I'll allow this for now. This is bullshit. Joe, you're only fucking yourself. Whatever. Sean, that's gonna be a natural 11. Minus six from the unsettling words to make a five. Trump, what does a Meridona command Braca to do as he attempts to speak to Joel in that moment? Oh, it's a really simple command, Sean, and it's not a big deal. I simply say, silence. <laughs> as Braca attempts to speak, the party witnesses a Meridona turn to him and simply say, silence. Braca doesn't proceed to say anything. For the rest of you, it simply seems as if Braca might be taking a Meridona's role as the party leader more seriously now. <laughs> well, Joel, let's get downstairs and get you jingling a tune. The barkeep already told a Meridona that you're welcome to play and make merry all you want. The party makes their way down into the main floor of the tavern. The main floor is somewhat populated with a patron here and there. They all seem to be in some sort of hungover state, eating breakfast or drinking water, doing anything they can to just to try and get some solace from the pounding headache. Ameridona, Braca and Bushmaster take a seat at a table in the middle of the room whilst Joel takes his position on the little corner stage. Sean, I want to turn my head and throw a dirty ass glance back at the halfling bartender. You turn your head back and see the halfling bartender wide-eyed in panic. He's looking at Joel on the stage, then back at the hungover patrons at the tables. You can tell he fears the reactions that are about to take place. Sean, can I cast Sacred Flame on my fingertip to get his attention, but not fire it off, like I'm lighting a flip lighter? Yeah, I'll allow that. All right. So, I cast Sacred Flame on my fingertip in a real quick flicker to get his attention. Once our eyes meet and make contact, I give him a real dirty look and place my hand on the handle of my glaive on my back. The halfing makes eye contact with you, 
You can infer from his even wider eyes now that he immediately remembers your previous interaction. You can see him slightly slump on the bar counter and place his face in his hands, almost as if sobbing. I turn back around satisfied, ready to watch Joel. <clears throat> All right, Joel. Go ahead and tell me what you do on the stage. Then give me a performance role. Based on what you tell me, I may tell you to roll with advantage or disadvantage. Oh, good. I sit down on the little bar stool, Sean. I take out my trusty lute and quietly ensure that it's finely tuned without disturbing the fine listeners. Once I feel confident that I'm finely tuned, I'll clear my throat and take a sip from my water skin. Then I'll begin to play a soft melody with a gentle rise and fall of notes. My lyrics will speak of the wonderful beginnings of our party and slowly transition to our arrival in Goldcrest. I'll very lightly pick up my tune as I speak of our walk through the market and run in with a sweet elderly lady. I'll drop into a deeper and slower thrum as I pick away at my lute and attempt to beguile the crowd with the tale of our party being tricked by a succubus. I'll pick up my pace, but keep the lower thrums as I titillate the crowd with the tale of the simp and the succubus and the great heroes of Maradona, Joel, and Bushmaster, who came to his aid. And then I'll pan back out into a merry but middle-paced jaunt as I finish off with a quick whip of how the tale ends with a happy ending of a mystery solved and a town saved. Well then, wow. Joe, go ahead and roll Joel's performance roll with advantage. My high roll is a 25, Sean. As Joel finishes his song, he looks out on a small morning crowd in various states of emotion, some enthralled, some with a slight teary eye even a few standing ovations. The halfling bartender in the back stands behind his bar in an utter state of shock. Around half the patrons make their way up to the stage and drop coins on the lip of the stage. Well, I'll be damned. That was, that was beautiful. I've been forever remembered in the annals of history now. I, um, uh, thank you for hitting me with silence. I know the intentions were bad at first, but this couldn't have turned out any better. Joel, the halfling bartender, walks up to you. Sir, I want to apologize for any foul behavior I've laid at your feet. Not only was I blind to your talent, but I was also blind to the heroics you and your party would bring to our humble village. I will make sure that all who pass through my quaint tavern know of your song and tale. Please take this as a token of my gratitude and as my apology. I've kept it for years as a tool to make my life easier, but I believe it will serve you and your adventuring companions better. He takes your hand and places a decent sized brown bag in it, then walks back to his bar solemnly. As he walks back towards the bar, Sean, I raise my voice to him and say, thank you, my good friend. I will cherish this humbly given gift. Then I will walk back over to my friends and party. As Joel returns, I'll pop a hand on his shoulder and tell him, well done, goat man, you may keep all of your earnings. I want none of it. You earned it all to yourself with that beautiful performance. Sean, how much money did I collect off the stage? Once finally finished counting, it looks like you managed to snag a whole 12 gold off the tiny hungover morning crowd. Quite a large amount considering the circumstances. Oh, very nice. Joel, what's in the bag the halfling gave you? Uh, I opened the bag, Sean. When Joel looks in the bag, all he sees is an infinite, inky black void. The enchanting, never-ending emptiness of the internals of the bag seem to draw him further into a captivated state of awe. Never has Joel ever laid eyes upon such magnificent objects such as this. The magical theories that Joel currently has running through his head to attempt to understand the mathematical phenomenon occurring before his eyes are endless. If only he could... Joel, it's a bag of holding. Stop staring at it like you found an enchanted mythical loot or something. Ow! Oh, sorry. I guess I just got caught up on how weird the inside of the bag looks. Well, that'll be good to help carry any supplies in and any loot out of the mine when we're done dealing with the goblins. You still keep rambling about these supplies that we really don't need. A Maradona just humor me and let me personally buy us some supplies at the general store before we head out. You won't have to spend a penny. Fine. Fine. I'll agree to this. Let's head to the supply store. So the party makes its way through the village to the general supply store. 
Upon entering, the vibrant smell of various different odds and ends wafts into your nose. The sinews of rope, the grains of wood, and all sorts of oats, salts, dried jerkies and other common supplies. Behind the counter, you see an all too common race of Elysium, a simple human. He makes eye contact and hits you with a simple, warm smile. How may I help you find fellows today? I stride to the front of the party, Sean. Hello, sir. We've taken on the quest from the town blacksmith to clear the mine of goblins and have come to take stock of ourselves and our equipment before we head out. I have a couple ideas myself of things we might need. However, I was hoping as someone who might commonly sell supplies to the miners, you might have some recommendations as to things we should take with us to delve the mine. He gives you a keen look for a few seconds, then begins. Well then, friend, you'd be correct. I do commonly sell supplies to the miners. Well, I did before they shut down. Good of you to come ask. You'll probably be wanting some torches, as I doubt the lit ones from the miners are still going. You also might want some rope. I have no idea if the minecart bridges are still intact down there that they use. I also still have some of their alchemical explosives that they use to clear deeper passages into the mine. I doubt you would need it for that, but you might need it to clear your way out if a mine shaft collapse happens. Other than that, you'd know better what you need for combat-related things. I feel like all those are good recommendations. As far as combat-related things go, I believe we'd only want to inquire as to your inventory of health potions if you have any. Indeed I do, but it's only a small stock. We're just a simple village, so I don't bring much in on trade. I have five potions of healing in stock. Nothing special, I know. They're 25 gold apiece. All right. Give me one moment to converse with my companions. Sean, I relay all this information to the party. So, do you guys have any of this stuff already? Or anything that can stand in the place of it? I have a crowbar, a hammer, 10 batons, uh, 50 feet of rope, 10 torches, and a tinder box. I have that same kit, but I also have the jump spell. It can triple our jump distance. So that might come in handy for something. Um, the only semi-useful thing I have is a candle. I do have mage hand, though. I can grab and manipulate stuff 30 feet away. I can also make one of us invisible if I need to. I got rope, torches, and a tinderbox. Other than that, I'm going to destroy all the pesky goblins. Looks like we really didn't need to come by here. We already have the torches and the rope. Well, hold on. I was thinking we should at least grab a healing potion and one of those alchemical explosives. We got no way out if the mine collapses. I'll agree on the explosive. I don't have anything to clear rubble yet. However, Joel and Ameridona both have quite a lot of healing magic. I don't think we need the potion. All right, fine. We compromise there, then. I approach the counter again, Sean. All right, sir. How much for one of those alchemical explosives? He turns back to you and looks at you with a knowing grin. Phew, one of those is going to run you around 50 gold, friend. They're quite the industrial trinket. Oof, I don't have the gold for that, but I told Ameridona this was going to be at my expense. I'm going to try and persuade him down, Sean. Look, sir, I don't quite have that much gold. I don't think anybody is going to be buying any of these anytime soon unless we clear out this mine. I'd also like to not go bankrupt buying something to try and help bring a lot of your business back to you. Do you think you could do me a favor and help me out with the price on that? Go ahead and give me a persuasion roll, Obama. Ah, thank God, that's a 16, Sean. He looks down at the counter towards the alchemical explosive, then back at the pile of mining supplies that have sat and collected dust for a week. He sighs and then turns to you. I suppose you make a point, friend. It wouldn't be right of me to scalp you on a price while you're doing good by me and bringing a lot of good business back to my store. I do need something off you for the explosive so that I can take something home tonight. Business hasn't exactly been easy since the mine closure. However, you can have the alchemical explosive for only 15 gold. Think of it as a favor for helping keep my shop from possibly going under in the future. I gladly accept the deal from him, Sean. Thank you for the favor, sir. I promise that we'll have that mine cleared out. Your business will be back to normal here soon. With that, I turn back to the party with the explosive and let them know we're good to head out. Well, good. We have Bracca's little trinket now. Let's get to stepping. Uh, I'd like to get close to the mine before it starts to get dark so we can scout the outside. 
So, the party heads out of the general store and out of town. The trip down the dirt path that leads through the woods towards the mine is uneventful. After about six to seven hours, you begin to see an opening at the end of the path in the woods. You can clearly tell it probably means the mine is nearby. Shh. Everybody get into the woods to our right. Let's start creeping up to the edge of the wood line and scout out what's ahead. Everybody give me a stealth roll as you creep up to the edge of the wood line. Oh shit, I got a five. I got a damn four because I have disadvantage. Um, I got an eight. Oh, I also got a four because of disadvantage. Aren't we just the stealthiest bunch of morons? Like a bunch of drunk people in the woods. Despite the party's best efforts to be subtle as they approach the wood line, it couldn't be anything more different than subtle. Bracker stubs his toe on a rock and yelps. Joel clips his hoof on a mossy branch and falls, his loot making a loud twang. Bushmaster is just heavy as hell as a warforged. He's stomping towards the wood line as if he was a living vending machine. And a Meridona's glaive on his back seems to get caught on every single thing in existence. He can't help but get aggravated and curse every other Shit. time it happens. Damn it. He Fuck. thinks he's doing Damn it under it. his breath, but he's not. When the party reaches the edge of the wood line, everybody does indeed see the entrance to the mine. However, right as you get there, you also see two goblins coming outside to inspect the area, obviously alerted to all the weird noises outside in the woods. Shh. Everybody be quiet and wait for them to go back inside. Trump, give me a stealth roll to see if you effectively communicate that with the party and remain undetected. Ah, uh, shit. Dice don't screw the Donald now. I give a Maradona bardic inspiration. Oh, thank God. I'll save your bardic inspiration for later, Joe. I rolled a 17, Sean. Awesome. A Maradona very quietly gets the party's attention and hand signals to everybody to stay quiet and wait for them to retreat back inside. It takes about an hour for the two sentries to abandon the more alert status and head back inside, but they eventually do. All right, Sean, we're going to get up to the mine entrance and start making our way in. Okay. Everybody give me another stealth roll, this time with advantage due to it getting closer to evening time. And due to the fact that the goblin sentries just stared at the woods for a whole hour and saw nothing, so they're not paying as much attention. Nice. That'll be a 21 for me. So the advantage cancelled out my natural disadvantage and made my roll normal. However, uh, sorry guys, uh, that'll be a nasty natural one for me. Well, that's probably made my amazing natural 20 not matter now. The advantage cancels my natural disadvantage and I got an 8. Well, the good news is you guys were rolling for a group average of stealth. Joel's natural 20 is going to cancel out Bushmaster's natural one. Bracker's 21 will meet a Merry Donor's 8 and give you guys a pretty decent group stealth check. So, as the group makes its way up to the mine entrance, Bushmaster stumbles on a rock and almost falls with a clatter. But Joel manages to glide across the ground without making a sound, using Mage Hand to assist himself in catching you. He successfully averts disaster for the party in his adept use of bardic magics. A Meridona and Braca lead the way and have each other's backs. A Meridona taking the front, Glaive ready to take down all challengers, and Braca watching the sides, protecting a Meridona's flanks. The party successfully reaches the entrance of the mine without issue or being heard and spotted. All right, let's get in here and see if we can start picking these little guys off. As the party gently makes its way into the mine, Joel, your passive perception picks up some cackling noise off to your left. Guys, I think we have company up there to the left. Shh. Joel, sneak up there and check it out. Shh. No. I'm going to have to do it. Nobody can see into this darkness but me. Obama, give me a stealth roll to see if you can sneak up there successfully and scout it out. I got a 14, Sean. Braca glides across the stone floor of the mine silently, moving up near a pile of crates. As he peers over them, he lays eyes on a pair of goblins, most likely the two who came out to scout the surroundings earlier. They seem to be idly chatting about some nonsense. I sneak back over to the party, Sean. There's two goblins in there. Looks like they're chatting with each other. Well, let's go in there and clean their clock. I'm getting tired of this sneaky crap. These are literally goblins. We were told there were only eight to ten of them. That's literally nothing for us to handle. Sean, I light a torch and then I walk up and throw it in the room.
The rest of the party watches as a Meridona lights up a torch and tosses it into the room with the two goblins. This has immediately gotten the attention of the two goblins. Everybody roll for initiative. I got a modded 20. 18 here. Damn it, I got an 11. I got a 14, Sean. Uh, all right, both goblins were below that. So the order is Joel, Bracker, Bushmaster, and Meridona, then the goblins. Joel, it's your turn. All right, Sean. I'm going to run up slightly behind a Meridona and cast Vicious Mockery on the goblin on the right. It'll need to pass a DC 14 wisdom save. It fails, Joe. Roll your attack damage. That'll be two damage, and it has disadvantage on its next attack roll. Joel's stinging words pierce through the stagnant air of the mine and into the goblin's ears. The party can see the twisted look on his face as he suffers the emotional damage. All right, Obama, it's your turn. Okay, Sean. I'm going to run over to the right side of Joel and try to hit the left goblin with Ray of Frost. That'll be a 17 to hit and six damage. Brocker runs over and skids to a halt besides Joel. He slaps his hands together and conjures a freezing cold orb of frost. He then directs it outwards in a beam towards the left goblin, striking true. The goblin reels in frost-touched pain. He looks as if he could collapse at any minute. Bushmaster, at the beginning of your turn, you begin to hear cackling in the distance, not too far behind you down the other mine shaft. Oh yeah, fantastic rushing in, plan a Maradona. Here comes the rest of the goblin family. We're about to get surrounded. Sean, I run over close to the mine shaft that I heard the cackling coming from. I point my arm towards the 10 by 10 foot enclosed passageway and spray it down with grease. That'll end my turn, Sean. All right, so now it'll be the left goblin's turn. He's going to run up to a Maradona and attempt to hit him with his scimitar. He attempts to strike a Maradona, but his speed is so sluggish from Bracca's Frost that a Maradona easily sidesteps the blade. Now it'll be the right goblin's turn. He's going to attempt to hit a Maradona with his short bow. Oh yeah, that's awesome. Everybody is just trying to dogpile me. I think it's more that you're the big armored paladin with the massive weapon right in front of them. Um, anyways, he's going to roll with disadvantage because he's trying to hit a Maradona through his goblin ally. The goblin pulls the string back on his bow. He attempts to concentrate to attempt to aim around his goblin ally. However, at the moment he is ready to release his arrow, he thinks about the slew of emotional damage that Joel inflicted upon him earlier and releases the arrow. It harmlessly flies wide off to the side. Wait a minute. You skipped my turn, Sean. Well, uh, you know what, Trump. You're right. New table rule. If I screw you over as the dungeon master, you get a free inspiration. So, Trump, you get a free inspiration now, and it's your turn. Nice, nice. All right, Sean. I'm going to attack the goblin in front of me with a normal melee attack. No smite. That's going to be an 18 to hit. And then that's seven damage. Um, awesome. The party watches as a Meridona runs the small goblin through with his mighty glaive. He then slings the goblin off the glaive to the side of the mine passage, as if it was nothing more than a piece of garbage. All right, Sean, now I'm going to move to the archer goblin in the back and use my bonus action polearm master and strike him. All right, I rolled a 13 to hit. And then seven damage. All right, that'll hit the less armored archer goblin. The party watches as a Meridona rushes from his position towards the rear of the mining cavern. He nears the archer goblin and swings the pommel of his glaive across the skull of the goblin with a sickening crack. The goblin crumples to the cave floor motionless. As soon as the party thinks the combat has ended, Bushmaster can see three new goblins running down the mine shaft that he sprayed down with grease. They'll enter the top of the initiative order and take their turns immediately. Each of them will attempt to move through the grease-covered area and attack Bushmaster. Goblin 1 fails and falls in the grease-prone. Goblin 2 fails and falls in the grease-prone, and Goblin 3 barely makes it through, having slipped but just barely maintained his balance. He makes his way over to you, Bushmaster, and attempts to strike you with his scimitar. Just so you guys know, I have all your character sheets pulled up on the DM screen on my laptop in D&D &D Beyond. So that's why I never ask for your passives, armor classes, or DC checks on abilities. Anyways, the goblin manages to swing his scimitar and strike true on your Bushmaster, getting past your armored outer layers and hitting something critical. He'll deal three slashing damage to you. Oh wow, that's it? Oh, uh, I mean, ah, that's smarts. Very funny, Bush. Very funny. I'll remember that for later. 
Joe, it's Joel's turn. Thanks, Bush. I can't wait till Sean pulls out something later to take us to Clappleby's. Anyways, Sean, I'm going to cast Vicious Mockery on the goblin attacking Bushmaster. The goblin hears the stinging words coming from Joel, but manages to shake them off, knowing that he has comrades nearby, even though they're currently faltering. I'll save my bonus action for now, Sean. Baraka, at the beginning of your turn, you now also hear additional cackling and hollering coming from the other mining shaft, heading deeper into the mine. Out of the frying pan and into the oven, boys. We got more incoming from the other shaft. Joel, I suggest you stay helping Bushmaster. Ameridona, can you please come frontline for me over here? I can't take melee hits. Hey, I'm the party leader. Joel, you go help Bushmaster. I'm going to frontline for Braca so he doesn't get squished over there. Squished by the enemy or squished by you? <laughs> Shut the hell up, Joe. This fat ambush isn't time for jokes. Missed opportunity, Joe. Just like you missed that victory in the Middle East. Damn. Holy shit, Joe. Friendly fire. Anyways. Sean, I'm going to move slightly up to the deeper mine shaft and take the ready action. I'm going to ready a second level Rhymes Binding Ice spell. All right, Obama Bushmaster, it's your turn. Okay, Sean, I'm going to use Thunder Wave on the three goblins in front of me. They need to make that DC 14 Constitution saving throw. All right, so Goblin 1 is going to fail. Goblin 2 critically fails, and Goblin 3 right in front of you also fails. What's the damage? Holy crap. Double eights. That's going to be 16 damage, Sean. Very nice! Bushmaster and Joel look on in amazement as Bushmaster claps his hands together, and the thunderous force projects outwards from his hands. As the rippling force rocks across the shaft, it strikes each of the goblins in turn. The physical power is so strong that it flays pieces of skin off the goblins as the edges of the zone touches them. As the primary force actually impacts their bodies, their sternums and rib cages buckle inwards, their skulls cave in, and their internal organs rupture and burst. As the wave finishes passing over them, their bodies are left limp and not a sound is heard. Ah, take that scrawny little goblins. Maybe a Maradona was right, this is lightweight. Sean, I use my movement to adjust to the other mine shaft to help the rest of the party. Okay, Trump, it's a Maradona's turn. Sean, I take the ready action and prepare the sacred flame cantrip for the first goblin I see. Very good. As you guys prepare yourselves at the mine shaft, the cackling stops and you begin to hear chanting. Then a heavy stomping coming down the mine shaft. Ah, uh, shit, what? Well, that didn't sound good. Sean, I prepare the lightning lure cantrip for whatever comes through the shaft. Sean, I quickly run over behind the guys and prepare a vicious mockery. All right, Joe. The entire party prepares itself, weapons at the ready, and spells a light in hand. After a tense few more moments, a dastardly sight emerges before you from the mineshaft. A full cave ogre, followed by what looks to be about six more goblins, one of them appearing to be wielding a staff instead of a melee or ranged weapon. Sean, I release my rhymes binding ice. All right, looks like the cone will hit them all because they're all clustered up right now. So they'll all have to roll the saving throw. Goblin one fails. Goblin two critically fails. Goblin three fails. Goblin four fails. Goblin five fails. And goblin six fails. I think I need to get new dice or something. Now for the cave ogre. Wow, he'll also fail by one. I'm definitely buying a new set of dice. The NPCs have done nothing but fail saving throws this entire scenario encounter. Anyways, what's the damage on that spell of armor? They'll all be taking 14 cold damage, Sean. Uh, well then. The party looks on in amazement as Braca releases his prepared spell of frozen death. A wave of chilly frost washes over the goblins and their ogre ally. The cave ogre manages to weather the attack, but his morale is definitely damaged as he watches every single one of his goblin allies freeze solid, then fall over and shatter into hundreds of pieces. Sean, I release my prepared sacred flame at the ogre. Well, let's go ahead and roll that saving throw then. Of course, it fails by one due to its negative one dex modifier. What's the damage, Trump? 
Uh, that's going to be six damage, Sean. Well then, let's minus that off, and now we... Sean, I release my lightning lure that I had prepared. <sighs> yep. Yep. You sure do. Well, let's go ahead and do this. It's a strength-saving throw, so surely the cave ogre doesn't fail this. Today just isn't my day. Not fucking one. What's the damage, Bush? Uh, uh, mm. It's, uh, it's pulled ten feet towards me, and it takes five lightning damage. Cool. Cool. Go ahead, Joe. I know it's there. I'm not sure what you're talking about, Sean. I, uh, I forgot? I'm just gonna go ahead and roll that wisdom saving throw. Hell yeah, a five. What's the damage, Joe? No, I don't... I don't wanna... What is the damage, Joe? Uh, I'm scared. The damage is for Obama, help! So, now it's the ogre's turn. Bushmaster, you're right in the way. It swings its mighty great club at you. The sheer weight of the club smashes you like a grape and inflicts 15 damage on you. <sighs> All right, I'm, uh, I'm sorry. I got a little bit out of control there. Uh, let's just continue on. Obama, it's your turn, I believe. I, uh, um, okay. Yeah, uh, I cast Firebolt at the Ogre. Oh, no. What's up, Obama? Nothing. I rolled a five. I missed. Hmm. Let me see. Uh, no, no. Uh, there's nothing to see here. These aren't the dice you're looking for? Move, Obama. Let me see. No, Sean. It's a five, I swear. I will see that D20. Fine, then. Of course, it's a natural freaking 20. Go ahead. Roll the damage, Obama. It's going to be 11 damage, Sean. The party witnesses Bracker pull off yet another astonishing move of magical amazement. He conjures another larger-than-normal magical anomaly. This time, a lance of fire that jets out of his hand and strikes the ogre directly in the face. The ogre reels away in pain, its face left charred from the fire. Joe, it's your turn. I'm going to use healing word on Bushmaster. He will get eight health back. All right, then. Moving on to you, Trump. Time to finish, Rosie. O'Donnell, over here, off. I'm going to strike the ogre with my glaive and added smite. That's going to be a 14 to hit. And then we'll have 12 slashing damage along with a... a 10 radiant damage. The party watches as Ameridona charges the short distance to the cave ogre. He leaps through the air and pierces his glaive into the skull of the ogre. As soon as the glaive is embedded into the skull of the ogre, the party see the ogre's eyes glow bright with celestial light and then burn out. The ogre's body collapses to the ground. Ameridona steps off the body, glaive in hand. Light work. Good job handling all the little guys, Bracca. <sighs> it was pretty funny watching them all topple over and shatter into pieces. I've got to admit, it was pretty funny now that I look at it in hindsight. It was also pretty funny watching the look on that thing's face when Bushmaster grabbed it with that lightning lasso and pulled it closer. <laughs> it was already shitting its pants after it lost all its little friends. Next thing it knew, it was getting lit up and dragged closer to Deathland. I didn't think I'd already have more source material for a new song. Not sure what the name will be yet. Maybe I'll have thought of something by the time we're done securing the mine. Well, let's head down this passage they came from and make sure there's no stragglers back here. So the party begins heading down the mine shaft that the ogre came out of. As you guys travel, you notice all sorts of trash and clutter left around by the goblins. It seems that you might have fully cleared them out. However, as you near the back of the shaft, it opens up into a cavern. You hear some faint voices around a corner in the back of the cavern and see some torchlight back there. Looks like we got some stragglers in the back. Mm -hmm. Maybe this is where the short stacks are hiding. <laughs> Ameridona, wouldn't that be unhealthy? They're living in a cave, gross, unbathed. Part of the flavor. I know. You did not just say flavor. Uh, let's go bop these last stragglers over the head. The party approaches the back nook of the cavern, filled with the bravado of the constant victories of the past few fights. When you cross the corner, however, you see the hulking back of a large green orc and then the telltale red skin and jet black hair of two hobgoblin guards. You also see a small snivelling goblin in the corner, waiting with a cup in his hands 
and his eyes cast at the floor. Without turning away from what he is looking at on the table, he begins to speak to you. So, I guess the ogre didn't get the job done then. Who would have thought that Goldcrest had some adventurers worth their salt in the village right now? It's no matter. I guess this is just something I'll have to take care of myself. Well, I didn't really expect to turn the corner and find this. Who are you guys? My name is Orgum, but anything beyond that is none of your concern. You've set meticulously crafted plans back and caused problems that I can't afford. So I'm afraid your road ends here. Sean, I want to cast Detect Thoughts on this orc. Uh, Orgum. Something weird is going on here. Interesting choice, Joe. Well played. As you peer around the surface thoughts of Orgum, you can see anger and anxiety. You can feel that he carries a sense of dread at the possibility of failing his current set of orders. Do you wish to probe deeper? This will trigger the saving throw. Yes, this information seems tied to something bigger. All right then. Joel attempts to probe deeper into Orgum's mind for more information. However, as he does, he sees Orgum glance at him with a keen gaze. Joel can't seem to gleam any more information. It seems I might have already gifted off too much info with how relaxed I was being. You morons have any last words? And here I thought the ogre was the final fight in here. Shit. I came for short stacks and all I got was a big burly orc and his two hobgoblin lovers. Time to hand out the clapplesauce boys. Roll for initiative, everyone. 17 here. I got a 13. Hell yeah, 19 for the Donald. Damn, I got a five. Uh, all right, so the initiative is a Meridona, Bushmaster, Orgum, Joel, Hobgoblin one, Baraka, and then Hobgoblin two. Uh, all right, Sean, I'm coming in with a can of whoop ass wide open. I'm going to bonus action vow of enmity on Orgum for attack advantage. Then I'm going to attack him with my glaive and smite. Ah, uh, shit, that's an 11 and a 12. I'm going to assume that doesn't hit this big boy. You would be correct, Trump. A Meridona closes in on Orgum and attempts to deliver a mighty swing, but Orgum throws up his battle axe and blocks it. He stares you in the eye with a grin as you two lock weapons trump. Uh, not light work, boys. Shit! It's Bushmaster's turn. All right, Sean, I'm gonna cast my trusty catapult spell with that iron pot behind Orgum and then fling it at him. He needs to make a DC 14 deck save. He fails the save, Bush. What's the damage? Looks like that'll be 17 bludgeoning damage, Sean. The party sees Bushmaster snatch up the iron pot off the table with his catapult spell. He reels it back behind him and then flings it at Orgum with great force. It strikes him in the ribcage and the party could swear that they heard a slight crack. However, Orgum doesn't flinch and continues to lock weapons with a Meridona. I'm also going to bonus action guardian armor for four temp HP, Sean. Nice, nice. The party also sees Bushmaster activate his armor for the first time. Additional magical defensive runes spring to life on the armor, and the party hears a slight humming as the runes glow. Now it's going to be Orgum's turn. He breaks his melee lock with a Meridona, and begins his own series of offensive moves against him. He swings his battle axe with enraged fury and catches a Meridona off guard, connecting cleanly with the side of your torso and dealing 15 damage he then swings again at you, but having gathered his senses, a Meridona just manages to block with his glaive. Oof. Guys, this isn't a joke. Don't play around this fight. I got more than the wind knocked out of me just now. It's now Joel's turn. Uh, okay. Think, think. No panicking. I'm going to save my actual spells for healing and attempt to help a Meridona take the brunt of this guy's attacks. I cast vicious mockery on him. He hears your stinging words, Joel, and for a second you think it's worked. He then looks at you and shakes his head. You'll be next for screwing with my head so much, you flimsy music man. Oh shit, I've only pissed it off. All right, it's Hobgoblin One's turn. He points at Bushmaster and smiles, then rushes him. He swings his longsword at him, but Bushmaster just manages to get his mace raised to block the oncoming blow. It'll now be Bracca's turn. All right, Sean, I'm going to second level Witch Bolt the other Hobgoblin before he can attack me or Joel. Oh, thank God, it's a natural 20. Let's see. That's going to be 23 lightning damage, Sean. I'm beginning to think you have some loaded dice over there, Obama. <laughs> the party sees Braca strike out with a powerful blast of lightning. It connects with the Hobgoblin and shocks its body through and through until it's nothing but a burning and smoking corpse. A Meridona, now that it's your turn, 
you see Orgum witness the loss of one of his guards. As you two are locked weapons, you see him release a mighty battle cry in the air. I would say good job, Braca, but I think you might have just gotten me killed. Sean, I'm going to attempt to strike Orgum again with Smite at him. And then I'm going to bonus action, strike him with Polearm Master. My high roll is a 16, Sean. Does that hit? Yep, roll damage, Trump. Okay, that'll be 11 slashing damage plus 12 radiant damage. Now I'm gonna try and hit him with Polearm Master. That'll be a modded 20, Sean, with seven bludgeoning damage. The party sees Ameridona redouble his efforts to assault Orgum, now truly understanding the threat that he poses. He conducts a series of offensive maneuvers, first pivoting and confusing Orgum, striking him in the hip with his glaive and smite, then twisting backwards while twirling the glaive in his backhand to bring the pommel up, striking Orgum across the jaw. Bush, it's your go. Sean, I quickly drop my mace and activate my thunder gauntlets, then strike the hobgoblin attacking me. That'll be a 21 to hit and 11 damage. Well done. The party sees Bushmaster toss his mace aside and smash his fists together. They pulse and crackle with thunderous energy. He then strikes out and connects with the hobgoblin, who slightly doubles over from being punched in the gut with such force. We're back on Orgum's turn. He's visibly filled with hatred at the onslaught that Ameridona just dropped on him, so he begins to attempt to return the favor. Oh shit! He swings his battle axe with rage, but Ameridona ducks and dodges, then attempts a second swing with even more hatred, but Ameridona manages to roll out of the way. He begins a third attack with a guttural war cry, and finally manages to make contact with Ameridona, rending him across the back, dealing 19 damage, Ameridona barely remains standing, coughing up Gah. some blood. Gah. Joel heals, please. I can't take another hit like that. Joel is up. Oh yeah, this is what I'm here for. I cast second level healing word on Ameridona as an action, healing him for 10 HP. Then I cast Bardic Inspiration on Ameridona. Now Hobgoblin One will continue his assault on Bushmaster. He swings his longsword down on Bushmaster and connects on his shoulder joint dealing 15 damage due to his martial advantage. Bushmaster's entire body begins to spark at different places, the magic structure having taken a costly toll. Guys, I I, I, I don't ha have much more left to TT in the eminent pow pow power failure. Braca, it's now your turn, and you feel the full weight of the situation on you. Bushmaster and Ameridona are almost down. Joel can't keep up with the healing. Hold on, guys! We ain't going down in this filthy cave! Sean, I use metamagic to twin spell a second level Witch Bolt at Orgum and the Hobgoblin. Let's see, I rolled a 15, Sean. Braca conjures another Witch Bolt and twins it at both of the enemies. But having seen the threat that the spell poses, they both were preparing for it to be used again. Orgum and the Hobgoblin dodge the bolt. Damn it. Ameridona, you have to do something. They dodged my spell work. Shit, shit, shit. Sean, as an action, I restore 20 hit points with Lay on Hands, then I attack Orgum with Polearm Master as a bonus action. That'll be a 16 to hit and six damage. The party sees Ameridona place his hand to his own chest and a pulsing celestial glow thrums from his palm. He then stands quickly and swings his glaive pommel into Orgum's jaw, catching him off guard. Bushmaster, it's your turn. Sean, I'm going to magic missile the Hobgoblin. I've got to get him out of this fight. That's going to be eight damage. Bushmaster sends out three magic missiles from a mount on his wrist. They all strike the Hobgoblin. He reels back in pain and is left barely standing on his feet. He looks to be in a terrible way, coughing up blood. Well, damn. It's now Orgum's turn. He's going to continue to conduct combat with the Meridona. He quickly makes two vicious swings with his battle axe at Ameridona. However, with his renewed vigor from his lay on hands, Ameridona dodges and then blocks the hits. The two lock weapons and meet each other's eyes, both knowing that only one person is coming out of this fight alive. Joel is up. Sean, I cast a second level healing word on Bushmaster as my bonus action, healing him for seven HP. Then I'll use my crossbow on the Hobgoblin. That'll be a 22 to hit and Nine damage. Bushmaster feels a wave of healing wash over him as he's knelt on the ground 
and watching the hobgoblin hobble over to him, sword raised and ready to strike. You think about how the healing was probably useless, as this disgusting creature is about to finish you off. Just as he's about to strike, you see a crossbow bolt pierce through the front of his skull. The hobgoblin audibly stammers, stumbles a bit, then collapses to the ground. You see Joel standing a little ways behind him, crossbow empty and aimed in your direction. Ah, oh, great. I'm never going to get to live this one down. Damn it. Thanks, Joel. No problem, Bushmaster. Everybody rally to a Maradona. Braca, it's back to you. Going for another Witch Bolt on Orgum, my last second level spell slot. Damn it, that's an 11. I know that, Mrs. It's over to a Maradona now. Uh, come on, you big bastard. Just go down. Uh, I attack with my glaive and then bonus action with my polearm master. That's a 15 to hit. Nope, I'm going to use that inspiration to reroll. There we go. That'll be a 21 to hit with eight damage. Polearm master will have also 21 to hit with a seven damage. Nice. A Meridona leans down and cuts up with his glaive. Getting a good slice out of Orgum, he then shoves him slightly away with a grunt and twists his glaive around, locking him across the forehead with the pommel of the glaive. Orgum, seeing the fight not going his way, calls out to his little goblin servant. Pipsqueak, go detonate the cavern! Go now! The party sees the small goblin with the cup from earlier attempt to run out of the cavern nook. Bushmaster, you get an attempt to stop him or you can use your turn as normal. I'm gonna try and stop him, Sean. I use my lightning lure cantrip on him. He has to pass a DC 14 strength saving throw. He fails. The party and Orgum sees Bushmaster fire his lightning lure out from his wrist. It snatches the goblin up and electrocutes him until he falls to the ground. Damn it! Why won't you weaklings just die? You're ruining all the master's plans. Orgum swings at Ameridona once more. In his rage and panic, he misses both times, swinging wildly and without focus. Joel, it's your turn. Sean, I'm going to attempt to cast sleep on him. Now this is taking a turn I didn't expect. Roll the hit point dice, Joe. All right. That'll be a 30, Sean. Well, hot damn. I can't believe it. The party watches Joel play a gentle tune on his loot. Orgum stumbles a bit and his eyes grow heavy. He then collapses on the ground with a mighty thud. It only lasts for a minute, guys. What are we doing? I say we kill him and be done with it. He already had us on the ropes. He was weathering most of the attacks we could throw at him with ease. A single hit from him was decimating me. He has a lot of info that we need. A lot of the stuff he said leaves questions that needs answering. Everybody knows I hate to agree with the Maradona, but I think we should just be done with him. He's too dangerous to be left alive. It's not the hero way. Uh, shut up, you two, with your weird pop culture references. I'm killing him, and that's final. Start searching the room for any clues and info. He's got papers and stuff on the table. Sean, I move to stand over his body and drive my glaive into and through the back of his neck. I'm not going to ask for any numbers or anything. He's asleep, injured, and completely vulnerable. You drive your glaive into the back of his neck and through it with an audible gurgle. Orgum lays on the ground dead. Well, that's that then. Sean, I search the body. When searching the body, Amaradona finds a crumpled up missive in one of Orgum's leather pouches. He opens it and begins reading. Orgum had been ordered to build a strike force outside of Goldcrest. He was to attack the town four to five days from now after receiving around 25 goblins as reinforcements. His objective was to draw forces away from Citadel to assist in the main army's attack on Citadel the following day. The missive isn't signed. It's only stamped by a single symbol, an upright black hand with the thumb folded inward. The symbol is too intricate to be that of an all green skin force. Sean, I relay this info to the rest of the party. Holy crap, that's some serious stuff. We need to get back to Goldcrest and tell Captain Ironstone. Guys, there's more. There's two crates of chains and shackles back here. There's a note with the same sigil. It says, for the attained slaves. Yep, gather all the evidence we can. We'll detonate the entrance to the mine on our way out so those goblins can't use it as a base if they show up. I'm sure the mining guild will understand. They shouldn't have a problem clearing their way back in, especially if it's empty and safe. The party gathers up the evidence and makes their way to the entrance of the mine. 
Bushmaster, set the alchemical explosive wherever you think best to collapse the entrance. At the top will be best on the support beam. All right, we're all set. I suggest we get some distance. I'm starting the timer now. The party sprints back to the tree line and turns to watch the detonation. The explosive goes off and does its job, collapsing the entrance. However, gents, we're going to stop right there and resume next session. This one has been a long one. You guys can level up to five after that boss fight. I'll see you next time.